I've spoken now a couple of times with our 18-year-old son, Asher, after having dropped him off for freshman orientation week in the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M University. And in our first conversation, Pastor told me that in his very limited free time, that he and his buddies had gone repeatedly to Circle Dot. Now, I knew that the term buddies was a technical term that is used in the Corps of Cadets to describe the fellow freshmen. They use that term buddies to talk about the new friends in that group. But Circle Dot, I asked? Yeah, you know, Dad, it's that place a lot like Walmart where we got a lot of my school supplies. Target. And I said, Target? <laughs> and he said, yeah, exactly. Now, in clarifying, Asher told me that the core freshmen have a lot of rules about vocabulary. One of those rules is that they cannot use any words which are in any way connected to military or war or other kinds of physical violence. So you can't say target? I asked. Nope, he said. This led me to consider how many ways you and I speak many words and phrases without much awareness of either their origin or their implications. In a quick online search, I found an article highlighting, for instance, just how many American phrases, English phrases in America, just how many American phrases have direct connections to guns and explosions and killing. For instance, we talk about having big guns or being a big shot or a hot shot or a sharp shooter. We say somebody's on a hit list. We use the word bullseye. Somebody can be gun shy. Somebody gets shot to heck or shot to pieces. We talk about somebody as packing heat. We say my aim was off. An excitable person, we call her a pistol. Or say a person's trigger happy. We jump the gun. We see things as a smoking gun. Some people have a shotgun wedding. We may say a person is half cocked or a son of a gun. We say stick to your guns. We use troubleshooters of all kinds. We talk about having a killer instinct. Or when something's good and easy, we talk about it like shooting fish in a barrel or like killing two birds with one stone. I think there are likely lots of ways that our everyday language connotes images or conveys meanings or maybe even stirs up feelings of which we are unaware. There are things that happen maybe beneath the surface of our spoken language. But worse still, I think there are probably a lot of ways in which the nuances of the things we say are not really clear in terms of what we actually mean. Meanings we say things that we don't mean, or we don't mean the things that we're actually saying. And so much of what can be said gets kind of blurred or maybe buried in the ambiguities of spoken dialogue. How many of you have said something that wasn't exactly what you were meaning to say, but you knew if you said it this way, it was going to convey what you really meant, even though you didn't have to say the words that it really meant. Yeah? We all have the capacity to speak words, but to convey something that are not, is not present in the actual vocabulary that we're saying. So, we have this great power called the tongue. The Bible's full of commentary about how we use this massive power called the tongue. So today we're going to explore from among the multitude of voices. I mean, the Bible is full of voices talking about the power of the tongue. So today we're going to take a look quickly at what the Apostle Paul says in the letter to the Ephesians. So open your Bibles back up, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. 
We're going to look at verses 25 through 32. And again, that's on page 951 in the Bible right near you, if, that, if that's helpful to you. Now, Paul's letter to the Ephesians is about one-third ethics. And when I say ethics, all I mean is it's how we're to function as Jesus followers in our everyday world all the time. Uh, now, interestingly, I say our everyday world. There's really only one world that we live in right now. The real world is the only world available to us. We don't have other optional worlds to live in. So when I talk about living as a person in the real world, I'm talking about now. I'm talking about today and this real time and place that we're living. Christian ethics are guidelines or instructions about how to do this life right now. How we engage at school how we engage at work, how we engage at home. Christian ethics. About a third of Ephesians is Christian ethics. That is how to live every day. And so um, today we are going to pay attention to the real world instructions that Paul gave for how to talk or how to speak. Um, recognizing that this world is largely shaped by the words that we say and our lives are shaped by the words that other people say. This is just basic instructions about how to be. So Paul starts this section of ethics by saying this, you must live differently than the Gentiles. They are alienated from God because of their hard hearts. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greed, and impurity. That is not Christ. First word he said is in terms of how you live in this world, he says, you, church, must live differently. And I'm going to stretch that out to apply to how we speak and the way we communicate in this world. You must do it differently. So my first little engagement for all of us today is this little quiz. I have a quiz, and I wanted, this is a Christian vocabulary quiz. What I'd like you to do is to tell me which of these two lists of words is more Christian. All right, so let's look at list number one. Includes these words, spiritual devotion. That's a good word, isn't it? Spiritual devotion, substitution. One way we talk about atonement, substitution. Virginal conception, or plenary inspiration, sanctification, revelation. Those are big words, aren't they? Only frame most of those words ever used is church, talking about church things. So are those words more Christian or this second list of words? You matter. I love you. Or God cares. Or I'm sorry. Or you're beloved. Or you're invited. Come on. Which of those two lists of words is more Christian? It's absolutely the second list. Which brings me to my first point. If we are going to talk like Christians in this real world, our talking has way more to do with what's coming from our heart than the vocabulary words we enlist. It's less about vocabulary and much more about the nature of our heart that determines whether our language is actually Christian or not. I read a book recently by a guy named Jared Bias, and the title of the book is Love Matters More. And the whole book is written out of this premise about how many times Christians say something like this, I'm just speaking the truth in love, and how rarely anything that is spoken before those words is actually spoken in love is phenomenal. I'm just speaking the truth in love. That is so frequently said in a spirit of stridency and supremacy that it's almost certainly not spoken in truth or love. You know, um, the advisor would go on to say, if it's not spoken in love, it's not true. I mean, it may be factually, technically correct, but it's not truth in the biblical kind of sense. It's not the way God would speak. So, again... If our language is going to be Christian, if we're going to talk like Christians or talk like the church, then it's important to recognize it's what's coming out of us, not technically the words, but what's coming out of our hearts when we speak. 
So Paul gives us some guidance in terms of the technicalities and the heart when it comes to speaking. And one of the things he says is in verse 25 of chapter 4, he says this. Let's read it together. First thing, so then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members one of another. We are members one of another. I'm doing a wedding later this afternoon, and one of the guidelines I always give to young couples getting married is be very careful how you speak to one another. A great rule for any household is never let your words injure someone else in your household because those injuries don't go away. They will, oh, like Barbara said, you squeeze them out of the tube, you can't put them back in. One of our household rules in the King family was you must not hurt each other with your words. You might say, I'm really mad. You might say, I'm hurt, blah, blah, blah. But we don't hurt each other. I say that to young couples because when a couple gets married, the degree to which you degrade your spouse, you're degrading your own marriage. You're diminishing the person that you're going to commit to. And why would you do that? You're going to be committed to them for a long time. So don't speak words that are harmful or hurtful. I was thinking this week about the news. Anybody still watch the news? If so, you have a mighty threshold for hard things. I was thinking and pondering this week about how bad the news is these days. It just always seems bad. Now, interestingly, we can demonstrate very objectively with data of all the measurable realities that we talk about making life good or bad. We can demonstrate easily that the world has never been better than right now. There is greater access to food and clean water and shelter and health care and even justice right now than has ever been true in the history of humanity. We can demonstrate it easily. We can likewise prove that it has never been safer to live on planet Earth than right now. Widespread indiscriminate violence and poverty and disease is less in 2021 than it has ever been in human history. Yet, in the West, human despair and depression and anxiety is also at an unparalleled apex. We can demonstrate that. And things like the fact that the demand for therapists and antidepressants and alcohol sales have never been higher than right now. And it brings me to the question, what in the world is going on that we can show by solid data? It's not even close. The world is way better now than it has ever been on all these objective scales. So why is it that Westerners are so burdened and full of despair right now? And I think at least part of it is because of the way that news and our public dialogue is happening right now. What I'm talking about is this. We are tuned in to voices, whether it's news or social media, and the news that we're getting, so much of our news and our public di dialogue is way less focused on reporting the facts that are actually happening in the world and almost completely given to a different motive, the motive to try to make someone else look terrible. The attempt to demonize other people and create suspicion and stir up outrage and create all kinds of scariness about other people. You just think about the voices that you're hearing in the world right now and the amount of energy. You can detect it. How much of their energy is actually given to trying to make someone else look bad? It's just almost everywhere. That puts us as recipients in a place where those words are burdening us in a way where we can't function anymore because not only is something bad happening, but it's always because some really insidious, evil, demonic power in the world is making it happen. So we have the problem and then we have the reason for the problem. Here's some examples. The world is heating up right now. That's bad news. It's objectively true. The temperatures are going up all over the world. But... The world is heating up right now because of greedy petroleum tycoons who hate trees and hate frogs and hate clean water and hate children and hope we all die is how that story gets told. And it's not true all the way. 
In order to demonize petroleum tycoons that way, uh, you have to use some wisps of falsehood. You have to characterize those people in a way that is not accurate. I mean, there may be some of those people, but that's not the universal truth, and that's not the only reason or the primary reason why the world is heating up right now. But you see, if I can demonize petroleum tycoons, then I can sell newspapers because that stimulates outrage. And it increases fear and concern about how bad people are in the world causing these terrible things to happen. Here's another example. Afghanistan is a tragedy. I would say Afghanistan is a tragedy that has been decades in the making. And it has been a tragedy for a really long time, actually. But the motive to frame that this tragedy is the result of this presidential administration or the last one, it taps into a completely different set of receptors in us that cause us to get into this mode of like having to determine who's the good guy and who's the evil one. And it actually distracts our energy from trying to solve problems in Afghanistan and completely enlists us in trying to figure out whose fault it is so we can blame somebody. So you and I walk away with all of these burdens of not only is there this tragedy, but it's because of the really evil people who made it all happen and stand to benefit somehow or another. So whenever we do that, there's a technical term for that, and it's called an ad hominem attack. And it's a way of saying that this person is to blame because they are bad, they have flawed character, or they're greedy, evil, or they are bent on destruction of others. That's an ad hominem attack. My point is right now, so much of what we're calling news is actually ad hominem character attacks charading as news and sitting in and masquerading as news is this ad hominem attack. I think this is true. If the amount of energy which has been spent demonizing this president or the last one was investing in saying something positive or trying to solve real problems, America would be unstoppable. We're thoroughly engaged in this cycle of mutual destruction and we're all burdened by it. Paul said this, put away falsehood, all of it. No need to ratchet up the evil on something else in order to demonize somebody further. Put away falsehood. Here's a little quiz for us. See if this is true or if you've read this before. Next slide. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Anybody get taught that somewhere along the way? Of course, it's an ancient proverb. I like the way Thumper reiterated this. He said, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. Do you know anybody like that? You've never heard a negative, degrading word come out of their mouth about somebody else? I know a couple of people like that, and they stand as like icons in my world because I've never heard them say anything derogatory about another person. True or false? Quiz number three. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Categorically false. <laughs> it's absolutely not true. I, however, think Robert Fulgham got it right when he said it this way. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will break our hearts. Friends, our words have great power. Recognize that in everything that you say. Now, we're going to take a couple of minutes and do something a little different for some of you. And that is, uh, all of us confessed to begin with that we had said something we wished we hadn't, or maybe said something that we know we shouldn't have sometime in the last five years. So what I'm going to ask us to do is to spend just three minutes partnering up with somebody that we may or may not know, that we may or may not live with, and I just want us to tell each other one story, quick story, one minute story of a time we said something we wished we wouldn't have or we knew we shouldn't have as kind of an act of confession. So just three minutes. And if you're feeling extra courageous, I encourage you to speak with somebody who's at least 20 years different from you and actually cross the generations together a little bit this way. Laura's going to help us out with some music so your voice won't be quite so loud. So three minutes engaging with one another. Let's identify a time that we've said something we wish we wouldn't or knew we shouldn't. Let's do it.
open the um, time of confession, that you also made your way to a place of forgiveness and grace. And not so that you might repeat your mistake again, but so that you may not have to carry it around forever as a burden. The Apostle Paul says this as a second instruction. Let no evil talk come out of your mouth, but only what is useful in building up so that your words may give grace to those who hear. How many of us really like to receive words that build us up? Anybody not like it? <laughs> no, and you know, everywhere we go, you and I have the opportunity to be that person that speaks words which build someone else up. It's like we also have the opportunity to speak words which tear somebody else down. Scripture gives a lot of real-world examples of the power of our words, but it also gives some real-world examples of the fact that our words reflect our heart and our words affect other people. Jesus is the one who said that, you know, it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Which brings me to just look at myself and say, gosh, Lance, when you said that, what, what was in your heart? Like, what were you getting at when you said that thing? And maybe you can look at your own self and say, what, what, why did I say what I said? I don't know. <laughs> Jeremiah said, the, the heart is devious above all else. Who can understand it? <laughs> so, but the fact is, our words reflect our hearts and our words affect the world, the real world that we live in right now. The Bible gives lots of examples of that. Let me just hold up two examples to contrast the way our words affect the world. One is the story of the Tower of Babel. You know the story in Genesis? In the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis, they were going to build a tower which would rival God. And what Genesis records them as saying is, let us make a name for ourselves. Now, what do those words reflect was in their hearts? Was it? Pride. Oh, great. Pride is a good one. It's kind of an ego-drivenness, right? Let us build a tower and make a name for ourselves. It reflects things like an ego-drivenness of kind of pride or maybe even a little bit of a stridency, an arrogance of some side. I mean, they're going to build a tower which would rival God. There's certainly some ego-driven kind of domination in there. Now, what is the result of that story? What ends up happening? People who were previously united broke the world into a million pieces. That's the effect. The words reflected what was in their hearts. The effect that it had on real people is that people that were united got busted into a million pieces. Now... Um, let me contrast that with the story in Acts chapter 2 called Pentecost. You know the story? In Acts chapter 2, we have the gathering of at least 15 different ethno-linguistic groups that have all come together in a spirit of gratitude to thank God for what God had provided them in the world, their real world. And as they came together, God's spirit wisps into that place and remarkably, the languages that had been technically incomprehensible suddenly started having the effect of uniting people together in ways that they started praying together and eating together and sharing all that they had. Toward the Luke in Acts chapter 2, he says, there were no longer any needs in the world. Their words reflected the spirit of their hearts to come together and to build this new thing. In fact, that is the story of the birth of the church. Words that might not have understood coming together and forging a kind of community that could not be stopped. Our words have this tremendous power to either destroy us or to build us up. And I wonder if you had to categorize the voice of the church with a capital C in the world right now, is the voice of the church building up or is the voice of the church tearing down? 
I talk to a lot of people who say to me something like this, Lance, I, I really like Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with the church. I don't want anything to do with organized religion. I don't want anything to do with this. And what I find is this, it's not because they're unattracted to Jesus. It's not, because, it's not even because the moral code of the church is so high. It's because the voice of the church in the world right now is known for how it is dividing and tearing people down and telling people how they're not worthy or how they don't fit in or how they're coming up short or how... I'm not talking about any of you, Chestnut Grove. I'm not saying you're doing that. I'm just talking about the reality of the voice of the church with a capital C in the world right now is not a voice that is known for how we're building people up and how we're encouraging them and how we're telling them that you are beloved even in the midst of your brokenness. You're God's beloved. You're invited to the kingdom of God even though you don't feel worthy. That's not the voice of the church in the world right now. So, we have an opportunity to do something about that, don't we? We are the voice of a church, a congregation at least, one part of the church. What will our words be known for? I missed it a moment ago. This is not just the news, but it's um, social media. Anybody involved in social media? Yeah. I, my friend Nikki sent me a meme this week to give just one little reflection of how it seems that much of social media works in the world right now. So here's a meme that I thought was pretty reflective of what I understand about it. How social media works. One person, me, I say, I prefer mangoes to oranges. And then some random person says, so basically what you're saying is you hate oranges. You also failed to mention pineapples and bananas and grapefruits. Educate yourself. I'm literally shaking. <laughs> The Apostle Paul says this, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Hmm. Put it all away. You don't need it. You don't need to slander. You don't need malice, wrangling. You don't need all that. This word slander is interesting to me, probably because I needed to hear it. But the word is slander in the New Testament is, the Greek root here is blasphemia, which refers to gossipy remarks of any kind. Any kind of gossipy remarks that we put out there. There's this other New Testament word that often gets translated as slanderer, and that New Testament, that Greek word, is diabolos. Slanderer. In fact, two verses back when Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, for you give room to the devil, that is slanderer. You give room to the slanderer. And so what I think here is that just as Jesus said, it is the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give life and give it abundantly. When our words are in any way enlisted to steal or kill or destroy something else, they are of the diabolos. They're not the words of Jesus. They're the words of the devil. So, uh, I was thinking about some of the loudest voices in the public sphere that I can think of right now. And I was curious, if they just embraced this one verse, just Ephesians 4.31, and they put away all bitterness and all wrath and all anger and all wrangling and all slander together with all malice, what, would they even have a platform anymore? Would they have any audience if they just said, I'm just going to put all those things away, would they have anything to say that would be constructive to the building of our world? Or is their total program a program of malice and wrangling and slander? So I enlist you this week to think about the voices that you're listening to, your favorite pundits, your favorite newscasters. Because I think it is reflective of what they're actually doing in the world by what they say. And so, here are some questions. Um, are your favorite, is your favorite voice, are they telling the truth in a way that we can act upon it, or are they simply tearing the world apart? Second, if I listen to this person and what they're saying daily, will I end up loving my brothers and sisters more, or will I end up having more contempt and more disdain and more suspicion and more doubt about their character and all I think worse of them, words have power to shape our reality. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. 
things that we're listening to are shaping us. And the words that we say are shaping this real world. Let us be very careful about our words and what we're hearing. Let me finish with this, a big so what, I guess. The Corps of Cadets freshmen at Texas A&M, they are not allowed to say words which connote or connect to violence. It's just one of many freshman rules. But today, we are not Texas freshmen. We are the church. So I leave us with not a list of rules, but just maybe one final instruction. And that is, we might call this um, how to talk like a Christian. I'm just going to take one little section of Paul, and it reads this way. Next slide. Let's read it together. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's my typo. But none of you are critical of it, I know, because you're all kind and tender-hearted and forgiving and merciful. <laughs> Be kind. I mess up all over. Be kind to one another. Friends, if you want to talk like a Christian, this is where it starts. As we go from here and as we talk as the mouthpiece of the church, may we be known as those who are kind in the words that we say. And may the kingdom come through those words. Amen. Would you pray with me? God, I confess, we confess, that we say things that don't build up. And I ask you to help me and to help us. I pray for supernatural intervention into the way I exercise my tongue and the way my sisters and brothers here exercise theirs. May we become known as the ones who speak life into the world and speak love into the world. May we be as wise as serpents, but may we not talk like them. May we be innocent and generous and merciful and gracious. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. We thank you for the words of grace that you speak to us. The words of mercy which have set us free. The words of Christ which remind us that you so love us, you would do anything to communicate that. Help us be like Jesus in that way. For it's in him that we live and pray. Amen.